So we're gonna, the first thing that we'd like to start off with, with Allie, is a question that she wrote. Allie, you wrote a, an article called Crisis of Identity. And it's funny because the question that I have for you isn't even out of the main article. It was a footnote that you had included in there. And, but, but I thought it was fascinating. I actually used this footnote in my master's thesis. The one, one thing that we encounter a lot I encounter a lot of this, like I've had so many conversations about this where, so people want to draw a line and say on this side of the line, this is how it was on that side of the line. That's how it was. Uh, it, when I think one of the most major examples of this is whether you had clans or not. And on this side, it was here. They had clans on that side over there. They didn't have clans and something that you'd, you'd put in there. And this is the, the quote was you're talking about i believe it was in context of the, the battle of harla if i remember correctly um, i didn't put that in, include that in there uh, but you were referring to because you had this the reason i think it was that is because you had this force that was gathered from the aberdeenshire area and this other force that was coming mostly from the highlands and isles and they're they're coming to a gigantic head and there's a big, huge battle. And the, I mean, whether that was a context or not, the thing that you said was, they're talking about this Aberdeenshire area, said where, where Gaelic and Scots were both spoken and cultural differences were minimal. Um, that, doesn't, that doesn't connect well with people's desire to put everything in tidy little boxes historically. Can, can you speak about maybe this blurred line where it, it looks like a very mixed cultural environment that you're providing there for us? Um, yeah, so I spend a lot of time with my students talking about, just going back to what you said about everybody wants to put a nice line on stuff. Um, and I think as historians, we, we want to make sense of the past. So we create, and I'll come back to this in another question, which, you know, we create nice theories or ideas to make sense of how the past operated so feudalism this is a nice way of understanding how land was organized and dished out and I think it's much more messy I don't think it's any more complicated but it's messy the past is messy it is and drawing lines as we know on maps is the most unhelpful thing you can do um, or drawing lines on a map that actually then represents something on the ground is the most unhelpful thing you can do because it is messy. And so I, yeah, that if I'm talking about the Battle of Harlow, that it is about Aberdeenshire and Aberdeenshire is one of those areas that straddles what we call that Highland Lowland, I call it boundary. And um, people talk about the Highland Lowland line as if there is this line that is <laughs> drawn across Scotland. And I find it really unhelpful. I, and I remember writing Kinship and Clientage and at one point was trying to think of different words that instead of Highland and Lowland, because when we think of Highlands, we we immediately conjure up something in our head and we think of Lowlands, we immediately conjure up something in our head and that those two are very much opposed to each other. And that's the most unhelpful way of looking at it. Um, note that if you go to the West, Western Highlands and Isles, um, that Highland region, yeah, you have a very maritime community there. The, the richness of the culture is there with, with in terms of gravestones, in terms of material culture, in terms of language. Um, if you went to Lothians, you'd experience something very different, very lowland. But in that Aberdeenshire, Grampian, Highland, Perthshire region, that's the region I was looking at in, in kinship and clientage, what I call the Eastern Highlands, that boundary area that straddles Highlands and Lowlands. And so you have, so I looked at the Macintoshes and Clan Hatton and the Clan Grant, two very different clans, Clan Grant, different origin theories, but lightly descended from Anglo-Normans who may or may not have spoken Gaelic or certainly when they first arrived in Scotland did not speak Gaelic and in this area you know lived up against side the Macintoshes and Clan Hatton who had a very different origin very much spoke Gaelic um, and so were of that world but also their their superior their landlord their lord Gordons of Huntley um and this is where it gets complicated. They are a lowland family, okay? An absolutely lowland family. They would have been horrified if you'd ever described them as, as a Gallic clan. And yet, when we get into the 18th century, because of the Gordon Highlanders, you get some people talking about them as a clan. They're not a clan. They, they'd have hated any sense that you described them as a clan. They were a very Catholic family. 
very um very proud of their of their power their influence around Aberdeenshire um I was up in Huntley recently and and back at Huntley Castle that I haven't been to for years and it's a phenomenal structure um the architecture heraldic design all of that if you'd ever described them as a Gallic clan they really would have been quite upset with you and yet their tenants are some of them are gales and so th there's that mixing of of cultures so that that they're would the Ga Gordons of Huntley have spoken Gaelic? Possibly. Mm. But the tenants would have spoken both Gaelic and English. They would have written in English or Scots, but they would have spoken Gaelic. So it's that sense of, you know, this is a world where you're straddling two cultures, two communities. Um, and to so to say, here's where the Gales lived or here's where the non-Gales lived is, is very problematic. There was a lot of mixing over that, that Highland Lowland boundary. I think that's really what I'm getting at. So, and the Battle of Harlow, I think, is where you get a sense of, okay, you have the Crown forces. A lot of them would have been drawn from Highland families because of where Harlow was fought. And you have them going against Donald of the Isles, who would have had, yeah, Gales and non-Gales. And, and same as, as, you know, Culloden. You know, you had Scots fighting, fighting on both sides of the army or of, of the battle, you know. Um, it's not as straight cut, straightforward as... Here's the crown versus the the Gallic forces. It was never always that easy and simple. Do you think partly it's the historiography? Because sometimes it is like very straightforward with the Battle of Harlaw. They they present it as the, the Teuton versus the the Celt. In in later terms, when they saw everything in these, and they would use very racial descriptions of these two, and and this group of people are like this, and this group of people are like this, and yeah, like especially with the Battle of Culloden, and that's. I don't think we appreciate sometimes the Highland element that was part of that, the, gov the government forces on that one. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think it's the historiography, and I think it's also a result of, I, I think, how history is written since Culloden. I think Jacobitism, because it was a very real fear and a very real threat to the security of the Hanover Hanoverian regime and indeed the British state for a long time, that categorization that description of of highlanders as uncivil i mean that's been there since john forden it's been there for for centuries that highlanders are not civil they're uncouth they're barbaric they're lawless that has become entrenched and and over the 18th 19th and into the early 20th century it was written in that way to, to sort of well this is how the past was without really unpicking it um, and you see that in other cultures, you know, very easily some cer certain different um, communities, people's races are, are described in a certain way because that's how they always were without really looking at, at it objectively and trying to unpack the layers and layers of bias and prejudice and historiography that are, that are put on top of that. Um, and because, so we look at, high, at Culloden as the defeat of of. Gallic society almost. Um, and there's a real, you know, concentrated suppression of Gallic culture after Culloden. We look at it as, well, it failed, you know, um, and, and we write it backwards. I, I think sometimes that's a problem with history is because, and something I'm really clear in, in, in when I'm writing that I'm not, I don't fall into this trap is because we know the end result, we then write the past because we lead up to that, because we know that clan society, essentially, although it wasn't that, was defeated at Culloden, and it wasn't that simple. We write the past as if Jacobinism was always doomed to fail, as if clan society was always doomed to fail, and, yeah. and that's not how it was. Um, and so, yeah, that, that that is written back into the 13th, 14th, 15th, 16th century, that, that clan society was always defeated by the crown, and it wasn't. And I spend a lot of time my focus is really 16th early 17th century um and i'm really on picking the reign of james the sixth and first at the minute and the narrative is that you know he gains the upper hand over the highlanders he's able to defeat them he's able to pacify the region <laughs> when you look when you unpick it you kind of go yeah okay but it's after he has failed so many times you know he tries all these policies and none of them work and um, and this expedition that he takes to the Isles in 1608, and, and everybody says, you know, this was a successful expedition that led to the statutes of Iona, no she negotiate agreement. I think, but, yeah, but in the face of, you know, poor planning, 
poor execution, poor resources, all of that, he manages to, to do that. Um, you know, so it's sometimes how we write these general broad narratives, these overarching narratives, and that's not really helpful because when you drill down into it, I sort of think, yeah, I, I don't think that's how it was, really.